is seen at first to be only a painting, the inanimate creation of an artist's palette. Yet it was in reality a thing with a strange and terrible life of its own, a thing possessed with the power to destroy. Quite by chance, that Lord Henry Wooden dropped by Basil Hallwood's studio that day in June, so many years ago. Yeah. This is your best work, Basil, the best thing you've ever done. A picture like this set you far above all the other painters in England. You must allow me to think of a title for it, something to do it uh, justice. I'm going to call it The Picture of Dorian Gray. Why on earth something so pedestrian as that? Because that is what it is. Do you mean you did this from life? Yes. Does your Dorian Gray really look like that? I'm not sure I really captured him. He has such a simple and beautiful nature, all the candor and purity of youth. And he sounds quite extraordinary. Does he belong to the Blue Book? <laughs> Harry, you're incorrigible. It'd be a terrible shame if someone looked like that belonged to the lower classes. He's the late Lord Kelso's grandson. Oh, he must have pots of money if Lord Kelso did the right thing by him. I believe he does. This Adonis of yours has beauty, money, and all the candor and purity of youth. But tell me, Basil. Does Dorian Gray have any wit, any intellect? Well, you can judge for yourself. And uh, why is that so important? Because I choose my friends for their good looks, my uh, acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies uh, for their good intellect. Dorian, I'd like you to meet an Oxford acquaintance of mine. Lord Henry Wooden, Dorian Gray. Lord, Lord Henry? Oh, I've heard of you so often from your aunt, Lady Agatha. So you are the young man who my aunt uh, told me she had discovered, the one with whom she plays the uh, duet. Yes. Uh, she says you're very talented. Oh, thank you. You must also be very brave. When Aunt Agatha sits down at the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two people. <laughs> <laughs> that really is very cruel. She does try so hard. You're much too young to be so generous. Uh, Henry, I'd like to do some more work on the painting now. Oh, don't let me stop you. I intend to keep Mr. Gray uh, amused. You neither talk nor listen when you work. It must be dreadfully tedious for your unfortunate sitter. Yes, it's so difficult to stand up here and pretend to look pleasant. Well, today you should be amused. But I warn you, don't pay any serious attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence on all his friends, with the single exception of myself. Do you really have a very bad influence, Lord Henry? There is no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. Why? Because when one is influenced, uh, he does not think his own natural thoughts. He becomes an echo of someone else. Turn your head more to the right, Dorian. We are all afraid of ourselves nowadays. Even the bravest man among us is afraid of himself. We, we strangle our impulses and poison our own minds against ourselves. We forget that the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. Resist it, and your soul grows sick. Now, you, Mr. Gray, with your uh, youth and innocence, have had passions that have made you afraid. Thoughts that have filled you with terror, with shame. Don't frown, Dorian. But you must uh, be neither afraid nor ashamed. You've got a wonderful creation, Mr. Gray. What this century wants is a new hedonism. Perhaps you are to be its uh, visible symbol. What Lord Henry said had a profound effect upon Dorian Gray. He had stirred within him those things which the boy had always been afraid to acknowledge. A sense of himself, of what he was, and what he might be. How tragic it would be if you were wasted. Lord Henry would see that it did not happen. But of course you know, Edward, how conscientious he is. And he's standing tomorrow at Parliament. Oh, he asked me to express his regret. His regret is my pleasure. Are you really as much of a sinner as they say? <laughs> Nothing makes one so vain as to be told that one is a sinner. <laughs> You are Dorian Gray. You yes, must let me right. introduce myself. I saw you with my husband the other evening at the opera. It was Lohengrin. 
be alone. Lady with Victoria, you. how do you do? It's you such know, a I think I like Wagner's music almost better than anybody's. Yes? It's so loud that one can talk the entire time without anybody hearing what one's saying. <laughs> and that's the great advantage. Don't you think so, Mr. Graham? No, I'm afraid I don't, Lady Victoria. I never talk during music. At least during good music. If one hears bad music, it's one's duty to drown it in conversation. Oh, that's one of Harry's views, isn't it? I always hear my husband's views from his friends. It's the only way I get to know them. Oh, but you must think that I don't like good music. Huh? I adore it, but it makes me too romantic. Oh. I simply worship pianists. They make one's room so picturesque. <laughs> oh, Harry, Mr. Gray and I have been having such a lovely chat about music. You're charming. I'm afraid I really must be going. I promised the Duchess to dine with Lady Thornbury. Goodbye, my dear Mr. Goodbye, Mr. Lady Victoria. Goodbye, Harry. Harry, she... She's lovely. She was, Dorian, was. Matter of fact, she was a beauty. Now she's merely well turned out. The bills I pay will testify to that. She is a marvelous liar, though. She never gets confused about dates and places, and I always do. I hate the way you talk about your married life, Henry. How sentimental you are, Dorian. Well, I like sentiment. It is a mask for deceit. It has nothing to do with truth. You must go out and search for truth, Dorian, as I did at your age. The world belongs to you here and now, because you have youth. And youth is the one thing worth having. Oh, I don't feel that. Because you don't feel it now, but time is jealous. When youth goes, beauty goes with it. You will suddenly discover that life holds no more triumphs for you. Gods have been good to you, Dorian. But what the gods give, they quickly take away. is a masterpiece. Dorian, come here and look at yourself. Don't you like it? How sad it is. Sad? Well, I shall grow old. The painting will always remain young. It'll never be any older than it is today. And there is no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty. Were I who was always to be young and the painting was to grow old. For that, I, I would give everything. There's nothing in the world I wouldn't give. I would give my soul for that. <laughs> I hardly think Basil would approve of such an arrangement. We'd be rather hard on his work. I should object most well, strongly. <laughs> well, of course you would, Basil. Your work is the most important thing in the world to you. I believe you prefer this painted image of myself to me. You sound as if you were jealous of it. Well, of course I'm jealous. Why should the painting keep what I must lose? If only, if only the painting could change. I could always be the way I am now. Well, it'll torture me someday. You should never have painted it, Basil. It's only canvas and color. But if it's to torture you, I'll destroy it now. Oh, it would be murder. It's only a painting, Dorian. No, it's, it's part of myself. I feel that. There is something terribly enthralling in the exercise of influence. No other activity is like it. Lord Henry heard his views echoed back with all the added passion of youth. He experienced a real joy. For where he led, Dorian followed. He was a marvelous subject for influence. But being young, he was susceptible to many kinds of influence. not by the moon, the inconstant moon, the monthly changes in her circle door, lest that thy love prove likewise variable. What should I swear by? Do not swear at all, or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the God. Gentlemen, there's someone here to see you. Come in. Sybil, my darling, this year gentleman's been coming every night to see you. How many nights is it, my lord? Five. Then it is you, my lord, who has been sending the flowers. I told you who it was who was sending the flowers. Why don't you thank the gentleman? She's very shy, my lord, but she is grateful. Oh, it's I who am grateful to her. She has no need to thank me. My lord, this now, girl... Please don't call me my lord. I'm not a lord. I'm nothing of the kind. You are more like a prince. Prince Charles. You see what a sweet child she is? Oh, she is more than a sweet child. She is a great artist. This girl has a very interesting history. I found her when please, she was... Please, I don't want to know where you found her. The only thing that matters is that I have found her. I'd like to watch you act every night of my life. 
thank you for letting me come out to see you. Goodbye. He may not be a lord or a prince, but he has the manners, and I'm sure he has the money. I always said that someday you'd meet up with the likes of him. Do you like him, Sybil? Always loved Prince Charming. Tonight, you will meet Sybil Vane, but first, you will see her play. And you will marvel at her. One evening, she's Rosalind, the next, she's Ophelia. I've seen her in every age and every costume. She, she's a genius, but she's quite unconscious of her power. She... <laughs> well, why didn't anyone ever tell me that the one thing worth loving in the world is an actress? Because we have all loved so many of them. You mean the kind with dyed hair and painted faces? Don't run down dyed hair and painted faces of extraordinary charm sometimes. <laughs> you don't understand, Harry. Sybil is shy and gentle. There's something of a child about her. her. Her trust makes me faithful. Her belief makes me good. And when I'm with her, I forget all about your poisonous theories. But if that's true, and this girl is all you say she is, the gods must have made her for you. Oh, she is. I'm going to marry her. That's impossible! You don't even know his name. I call him Prince Charming. Marriage. The whole thing is foolish. Oh, it's you who are foolish, Jim. Someday you'll fall in love yourself, and then you'll feel all that I feel now. I may be young, but I know more of the world now than you do. Oh, you dear old Jim. You talk as though you were a hundred years old. But that's only because life has been so hard for you, for both of us. But it's all going to be different now. Here you are, sailing off to a new world, and I, I found mine here. Oh, I wish I did not have to board the ship tonight. Sybil, are you ready? Almost. Is he here yet? Not yet. But hurry up, mind. If I could only meet this man and judge him for myself. Oh, Jim, you would think him the most wonderful person in the world. As sure as there is a God in heaven. If he ever does you any wrong, I will kill him. Oh, don't be so serious, Jim. You sound like one of those brothers in a silly old melodrama. I'm sure you would no. never do anything. To harm anyone I love. Not as long as you love him. I shall love him forever. And he? Forever, too. He had better talk. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Tis the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise. Son, and kill the envious fool, who is already sick and pale. Some place in which to find one's divinity. Don't pay any attention to him, Dorian. There she is. She is lovely. She leans the cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or thou wilt not be but sworn my love. Be a shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name, it is my enemy. Sir. Though I don't so, not in Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? What's in a What's name? What's in a name? A rose by any other name would Well, I don't suppose you would want your wife to act. So what does it matter that she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She is beautiful. What more do you want? Sorry to have had you wasted the evening. I must apologize to you both. That's a good feeling, Call commonplace a mediocrity. Don't talk that way about someone in power. She can't act. Let's go. I intend to see the play through. It is not good for one's morale to watch bad acting. Do let's go, darling. Go away, both of you. I know not how to tell you who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're
sun. I knew you would come back. Arise, home. fair sun, and kill the envious moon who is already sick and. Were you sick this evening? No. Huh. So you've no excuse for making yourself ridiculous. I'm sorry I acted badly, but I couldn't help myself. And you cannot help yourself. You shouldn't perform. My friends were bored. I was bored. Sorry to have been such a disappointment to you. <laughs> to think I once wanted to make a hideous old painted Romeo jealous. <laughs> I think I believe this vulgar scenery to be Verona. <laughs> oh, tonight I saw through the stupidity, the emptiness, the shadow. Then, dearest Prince Charming, you do understand. What are you talking about? Before I loved you, the theater was the one reality of my life. It was here that I lived. I thought it was all true. The people who acted with me seemed to be godlike, and the painted scenes all over all my world. And then you came, my beautiful love, and you taught me what reality really is, what love really is, that I can never act well again. You are more to me than all I can ever be. You used to stir my imagination. Now you don't even stir my curiosity. You're merely a shallow, stupid girl. A third-rate actress with a pretty face. Seriously, you're acting. No, I leave that to you. You do it so well. Please. Don't be cruel to me. I love you better than anything in the whole world. I will Please never see you me. again. to think of. And yet, there was the picture before him, the expression completely altered. If it were I who was always to be young, and the picture that was to grow old, for that I would give my soul. sense of having taken part in some strange tragedy came to him, but there was the unreality of a dream about it. And yet, there was the screen that he had placed in front of the portrait. had changed and would continue to change. It would be a visible symbol of his degradation, a visible emblem of his conscience. It told him that he had been cold and cruel. He would have to make amends. He would have to go back to Sybil Vane, marry her and try to love her. He could not bear his soul to be ugly. So you write Sybil and implore her forgiveness.
there will be an inquest, of course. Inquest? She killed herself, Dargan. She was found on the floor of a dressing room. She had swallowed something, something like uh, prussic acid or white lead or something they use in theater, Adam. Now, did she know your real name? Did anyone see you backstage last night? I've murdered her. I've murdered her as surely as if I'd cut her throat with a knife. It is all very tragic, of course, but you must not get yourself mixed up in it. Now, you must come and dine with me, and afterwards we'll go to the opera. Everyone will be there. It'll be very good for you to be seen. Dorian, not one of the women I have ever known would have done for me what Sybil Vane has done for you. I should have been in love with love for the rest of my life. Strange. My first love letter should be addressed to a dead girl. I was writing to ask her forgiveness, to ask her to marry me. Good resolutions, Dorian, always come too late. Their origin is pure vanity. What shall I do? You should dress and come to the club with me. I don't know if I can. I'll be at the club, and then at the opera. My sister's box is number 27. That's on the grand tier. Oh, uh, goodbye. I shall be there before uh, 9.30. Dorian, it be very wise of you to be seen. She had no right to kill herself. She was the only one who could have saved me. No one knew the danger he was in. Perhaps he should pray that the hideous union between himself and the picture might cease later. The choice had already been made. And what did it matter what happened to the image on the canvas? He was safe. That was everything. <laughs> Your servant told me you'd gone to the opera. Of course, I knew this wasn't so. But you should have left word where you'd really gone. I was so afraid you might have done something foolish. My dear Basil, of course I went to the opera. You should have joined us. I met uh, Lady Pamela, old Ashton's wife, for the first time. She's perfectly delightful. You went to the opera. And you can talk with other women while the girl you loved hasn't even the quiet of a grave to sleep in? Well, what's past is past. You called yesterday the past. Only the shallowest people require years to rid themselves of an emotion. I don't enjoy being at the mercy of my emotions. You speak as if you have no heart, no pity in you. I am what I am. There's nothing more to be said. Dorian, why have you put the screen in front of my portrait of you? Um, the light, the light was too strong. Too strong? Surely not. Let me see. I wish you tried to look at that painting. I promise you, I will never speak to you again as long as I live. It seems rather absurd that I can't look at my own work. Especially when I want to exhibit it in Paris in the spring. You, you want to exhibit it? You can't. Why not? Well, it's mine. Basil, I never came into being until you painted my picture. Sometimes I think that my birth dates from the day you finished it. To exhibit it would be to reveal the very mystery of my life. It's only a picture, Dorian. It's the mirror of my soul. And, Basil, I refuse to share my soul with anyone. I think it's a pity you don't have this depth of feeling for Sybil Vane, rather than for a canvas image of yourself. Goodbye, Dorian. Oh, Basil. Basil, we've always been friends. We must remain so. Let me see the picture. No. Goodbye. It had been mad at him to allow the thing to remain, even for an hour, in a room to which anyone had access. How shallow had been Basil's approaches about Sybil Vane in comparison to his own soul calling him to judgment. It must be hidden away at all costs. He had not entered the old schoolroom since he was a child. His innocent souvenirs recall the stainless purity of his boyish life. How little he had thought in those dead days of all that was in store for him. But the picture had to be concealed. 
There was no help for it. There was no other place in the house so secure from prying eyes. He alone had the key and no one else could enter. This servant was the only one who knew the secret of the picture's whereabouts. He would dismiss him. Beneath its shroud, the portrait will grow bestial, sodden and unclean. Hour by hour and week by week, the thing on the canvas would grow old and hideous, while he would have eternal youth, infinite passions, pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. Dorian, you are delightful, but dreadfully demoralizing. I really must be going. Do you blame this charade for yourself or for me? Oh, what a dreadful thing to say. You know you've absolutely no intention of going. Well, that's not true. I, I, I should have been home long before this. Well, Edward will be terribly upset. You tell Edward that uh, you met your sister most unexpectedly. And that she was suddenly taken ill and you were forced to take her home. I'm a dreadful liar. Mm. Lying is a skill that improves with practice. Well, I used to think I loved Edward and, and here I am. Deceiving you? Dorian's ethic was to deny himself nothing. This dogma became his Bible. Not only did he practice it, he delighted in preaching it to others. Here we are, Alan. You seem to know this part of London quite well. Mm, yes, I find the, uh, the diversions here more interesting than those of nature. would you want to come down to such a sordid and filthy hole? There are um, hidden and exquisite pleasures to be found here. Pleasures? Surely you, a doctor, have seen men suffer terrible agonies, suddenly relieved of their pain. Well, why shouldn't we, who are suffering the agonies of the soul, also find relief? Dorian, I know far more about drugs than you do. <laughs> do you really think so, Alan? Yeah, well, for a man of science, you're strangely lacking in experience and uh, curiosity. The more Dorian knew, the more he desired to know. The mad hungers he had grew more ravenous as he fed them. His curiosity of life seemed to increase with each gratification. The signs of sin and the signs of age mirrored the corruption of his soul. since the portrait had been painted. And then, it was the 9th of November, the eve of Dorian's 38th birthday. While Dorian was out celebrating his 38th birthday, a visitor had been waiting for him. A friend whom he had not seen for many years. Dorian. Dorian, don't you recognize me? Basil. I hardly recognize Grosvenor Square in this downfall. I've been waiting for you since night. I'm leaving for Paris on the midnight train. I plan to be gone a long time, and I have to see you before I go. May I come in? Oh, uh, won't you miss your train? I have time. But come in quickly, or we'll be so through. Oh. Francis? I took pity on your servant and told him to go to bed. I see. Can I, um, can I get you something to drink? Uh, no. No, thank you. Dorian, I must speak to you.
you seriously. Mm -hmm. The most dreadful things are being said against you. I don't wish to know anything about it. I've always been your friend, Dorian. And it disturbs me when people talk about you as being vile and degraded. I've always refused to believe them. and I can't believe them when I look at you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. In the lines on his mouth, in the droop of his eyelids. Uh, do come to the point. Why is it that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of a club when you enter it? <laughs> because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. And Lord Kent's youngest son? If Kent's silly son takes his wife from the streets, what's that to me? And Lady Singleton? What sort of lies do these people who slander me leave themselves that you should believe them? Then there are other stories. You go too far, Bass. Stories that you've been seeing going into the most revolting places in London. Why is all this dreary gossip so important to you? Because I can't leave England without knowing the truth. Dorian, you once told me something that haunted me. You said you, you came into being the day I finished that portrait. You said there was something fatal about it. If that's true, and if there's a link between that portrait and the things that are being said against you, I want to know. To know the answer to that one, Basil, you would have to see my soul. Only God can do that. Do you think so? Would you like to see my soul, Basil, would you? Yes. You are the one person in the world entitled to see it. You had more to do with its making than you think. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand you. You will. You see, I keep a, I keep a diary of my life from day to day. It never leaves the room in which it's written. But you, you may read it. I'd rather you told me the answer to my question than have me read it. Don't worry, Basil. You won't have to read long. Come in. You've talked about corruption long enough. Now you shall look at it face to face. Shut the door behind you. You think, you think it's only God who sees the soul, Basil. Draw back that curtain, and you will see mine. You're mad, Dorian. Years ago, when I was a boy and you painted my picture, I made a wish. Perhaps you could call it a prayer. I don't know whether I regret it or not. Remember when you painted it? You said it was a portrait of virtue itself. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> what is impossible? I don't believe this is my picture. Don't you recognize your own brushwork? That's your signature. Oh, the room's damp. Mildred must have got into the canvas, or the paints I used must have had mineral poisons in them. No. This is the face of a monster. It is the face of my soul. My God. What a lesson. What a dreadful lesson. Pray, Dorian, pray. The prayer of your pride has been answered. The prayer of your repentance will be answered also. I can't pray, Basil. It's never too late, Dorian. Kneel and pray. I can't. Why have you kept it? Hour after hour, I've stood before this painting of yours, passionately absorbed in its, in its mere existence, sometimes loathing it, but at other times filled with the kind of pride that is half the fascination of sin. Smiling with a secret pleasure at this misshapen image that bears the burden that I should have borne. I should have destroyed it there. I painted it. Dorian, it is monstrous. I didn't paint it. You did.
so sorry to wake you up, Francis. I forgot my latch key. Uh, what time is it? Uh, ten past two, sir. Ten past two? Oh, oh I had no idea it was so late. Uh, did anyone call this evening? Uh, Mr. Basil Hallwood, sir. He stayed for some time, then told me to go on to bed. I don't know when he left, sir. Oh, dear, I am sorry I missed him. Did he, uh... Did he leave any message? Uh, no, sir. Except that he had to catch the boat train and would write you from Paris. Thank you, Francis. I'm going to write a letter that I want to be delivered first thing in the morning. Will you take it round to Mr. Alan Campbell and uh, wait for a reply? Well, oh, very good, sir. Thank you, Francis. That'll be all. Uh, yes, sir. Good night, sir. I never intended entering your house again. But your note said it was a matter of life and death. It is a matter of life and death, Alan. Uh, do, do sit down, please. In a locked room at the top of this house, a room to which no one but myself has access, a dead man is lying on the floor. He's been dead for eight hours now. I don't want to hear your horrible secrets. They don't interest me. Oh, this one will have to interest you, Alan. You're the one person who can help me. You see, you're a man of science. So what I want you to do is to destroy the body upstairs so that not a vestige of it will be left. No one saw the man come into the house. He's supposed to be in Paris, so he won't be missed for months. But um, when he is missed, there must be no trace of him found here. You see, Alan? I killed him. So you must change him and everything that belongs to him into a handful of ashes that I may scatter into the air. I shall have nothing to do with it. Alan, they will hang me. And you will deserve it. You refuse? Yes. I have a letter already written. You see the address. I'm sorry for you, Anna, but you see, you leave me no alternative. If you don't help me, I will send it, and you'll know what the result will be. I tried to spare you. It has to be done. Face it and do it. I can't. You have no choice. Spare himself, Dorian left Alan Campbell alone with his task and went to spend the day in Selby. I do detest the country. Dorian, I don't know why I put up your whim. You put me through a tedious journey during which I may add you said not one word. And now that we're here, you tell me we're going to turn right round and go back to London. Surely you didn't drag me all the way down to Selby for a breath of fresh air. I just wanted to come to the country today. You didn't have to come with me. Of course, I didn't have to come. You seemed so eager for company, I thought sure you had something to tell me. By the way, you ran off very early last night. What did you do afterwards? You, you left before 11. Did you go straight home? No, I didn't get home till nearly 3. Uh -huh. Did you go to the club? Yes. No, I, I didn't go to the club. I, I, um, I walked about it. Well, I forget what I did. You're too inquisitive, Harry. I didn't get home till nearly ten past two, if you wish to know the exact time. I'd left my latchkey at home, and the servant had to open the door. If you wish any corroborative evidence on the subject, you can ask him. Sorry, what on earth is the matter with you today? Nothing is the matter with me today, Harry. Aren't they lovely, sir? Yes, very. My father told me you had a great fondness for fresh cut flowers, so I cut some every day and placed them in the house just in case you arrive unexpectedly. I did today, sir. Um, your your father? Joseph Merton, 
sir, the gardener. But then, then you are Hetty. But the, the last time I saw you, you, you were no more than a child. Well, that was last year, sir. A year can make a great difference in some people. Not Mr. Dorian, sir. Ah, you find him handsome. Hmm? Yes, sir. Will you excuse me now, sir? Oh, of course. To get back my youth, I would do anything in the world. Except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. You find her delightful, eh, Dorian? It's extraordinary, but I haven't noticed before, but she's, she's so much like Sybil Vane. Ah, still sentimental. Perhaps. Well, are you quite positive you want to go back to London uh, now? Yes, I must. done what you asked me to do. You have saved me from ruin, Alan. I can never forget that. Neither can I. of Basil Hallwood was gone. But his epitaph was written upon the picture. To blot out the murder of Basil Hallwood, Dorian Gray went to the one place where he knew he could buy oblivion. We are very honored tonight, Lucille, dear. Let me pass. You pass, when I let you pass. What do you want, money? Oh, all your money couldn't pay me for what you've done to me. There he goes, the devil's bargain. Don't call me that. Prince Charming. That's what you'd like to be called, isn't it? Prince. Charming! Uh, 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 what do you want, money? Why did you move? I'll kill you! What have I done to you? Sybil Vane was my sister. What has that to do with me? She killed herself. I swore I would kill you in return. For years I tried to find you. I had no clue, no trace. I knew nothing about you but the name she used to call you. Prince Charming. Make your peace with God. Wait. Wait. How long is it since your sister died? Eighteen years. Sit me under the lamp and look at my face. I almost killed... Forgive me, sir. The mask of youth had saved him. But death had come too close. Seized with the wild terror of being hunted, he fled London for several months and sought refuge in the quiet of his country home at Selby. This has always been my favorite place. And when I was a child, it was my secret place. I used to come here alone and sit for hours and pretend the most wonderful things. What did you pretend? I promise you won't laugh at me if I tell you. <laughs> I promise. You see, you're laughing now. Oh, I'm sorry. I shall be very, very solemn. Well, I used to pretend that I was a fine lady and uh, I had a great house in London and beautiful clothes and a carriage and four horses. And I used to come down here on weekends and go to all the grand parties. Why did you want to be one of those ladies? They're beautiful. Oh, you're much more beautiful than any of them. Say things like that. It'll turn my head. I only say what's true. You are the dearest man I've ever known. And have you known so many men? Only the boys in the village. They're all silly and stupid. Not like you. Oh, but I am very wicked. Oh, I know you're not wicked. 
wicked people are always very old and very ugly. You are young, handsome, you are good. What a child you are. I'm not a child, I'm 18. <laughs> Why won't you ever take me seriously? Oh, I do. I take you very seriously indeed. Oh, you are perfection. You're all the things that I've lost. Innocence, purity, goodness. My being here with you has made me happier than I've ever been in my life before. Then you will stay on here? No, I must leave. Why? Well, if I stay, I... I shall only break your heart. I do not understand. Yes, that's why I... That's why I'm so fond of you. <laughs> I should have thought the novelty of being decent would have given you a thrill of real pleasure, Doris. <laughs> I have a new image of myself, Harry. I've told you I am going to change. <laughs> My dear boy, I knew you had stayed too long in the country. You developed the most curiously boyish attitude. This was not a frivolous gesture, Henry. I spared someone because of love. Can't you understand that? I really love Hetty. <laughs> but you won't marry her. And now that you've left her, do you suppose she will ever be content with some rough carter or grinning plowman? I dare say that in a month, she would be floating down some starlit mill pond <laughs> with lovely water lilies all around her, like a video. You make fun of everything, Harry. I'm sorry I told you about Hetty. Let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> what, what an exquisite life you have led, Diane. You have drunk deeply of every cup. And yet it has not marred you. Nothing has been hidden from you. And yet you still look as young and innocent as the day I met you. Tell me, darling. What is your secret? Why is it that we have all had to pay the piper and you have got off scot? paid much more than you think. I've suffered agonies you could never conceive of. I don't think I would care to. Besides, I don't believe you, Dorian. You don't know everything about my life, Harry. I think that if you did, even you would turn against me. <laughs> don't laugh. I am going to be good. I must be. Repentance and reformation. Don't be silly, Dorian. You can never change. I will. I will. I'm even a little changed already. You are what you are. And what you have always been. And what you will be. I'll see you at the club. What Henry said could not be true. He had changed. Surely signs of evil were already gone from the picture. More loathsome possible than before. It's not true. It's not true. It wasn't my vanity or hypocrisy that I spared her. It's you. You are the evil one. You. Why have I kept you so long? You give me no peace. You have destroyed me. I will be free! What was that sound? I don't know, sir. Came from up there. From the schoolroom, sir. When they entered the room, they found a dead man lying on the floor. He was withered, wrinkled, and loathsome. 
It was not until they had examined the rings on his fingers that they recognized who he was. Against the wall was Basil Hallward's splendid portrait of Dorian Gray, as they had last seen him in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty. Makeup created by Dick Smith. Hairstyles by Ernest Adler. This program has been pre-recorded.